our working definition at the Center for Psychology and Social Change is that eco-psychology is a developing theory and practice which promotes sustainable and mutually enhancing relationships within and among humans and between humans and the more than human world. Big mouthful. We really look at, since we f tend to focus on mental health and psychotherapy, we look at the soul's need to place itself within the great scheme of things. Bringing psychology and ecology and through ecology living systems theory together to develop this theory and practice. If you go back to the 1960s, not much more than a generation ago, one of the great insights in psychotherapy and in psychology generally was the degree to which people are shaped by their families. We now take this to be obvious. Nobody doubts it anymore, that the family is a meaningful context for defining mental health. If you turn on television these days, you'll hear talk shows in which everybody claims to be the, uh, the casualty of a dysfunctional family. It's hard to believe that no more than 20 or 30 years ago, this phrase, dysfunctional family, did not exist. And the goal of eco-psychology is to make it clear that many of us may be suffering much more deeply from dysfunctional environmental relations than we are suffering from dysfunctional family relations. But the structure of the insight is exactly the same. What is the context within which you define sanity? What is the context within which you define mental health? We know that we are not living sustainably in the world in a physical sense that we're using up resources that are unreplaceable and uh, that we're not paying attention to the future. What we tend not to know and what part of our work is, is that we are not living sustainably in a psychological sense also. That our psychic resources are being used up by our lifestyle, our way of living. Dr. Sarah Khan is a clinical psychologist in private practice in Massachusetts and an instructor in psychology at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Theodore Rozak is a professor of history at California State University, Hayward. He is the author of many books, including The Voice of the Earth and co-editor of Eco Psychology, Restoring the Earth, Healing the Mind. I approach uh, eco psychology from the viewpoint of an environmental writer and speaker uh, who discovered about four or five years ago that it was getting more and more difficult for me to address audiences about uh, the environmental crisis. Um, I take it to be the great moral and political issue of our times. Uh, but I found that I was essentially trying to scare them or I was trying to shame them on the assumption that if I scared them enough or I shamed them enough, I would change their behavior and make them good environmental citizens. But in fact, it doesn't. So I found myself asking, is there another approach that is affirmative, um, that appeals to the best in people, that appeals to essentially positive motivations, uh, and which I can believe will change people. And I found that while this sounded like a question of public relations, it was actually a, a deep philosophical question. Because it amounts to asking, when we present people with the environmental crisis of our times, what is it we're calling upon in them um, to respond to that crisis? Uh, if it's nothing but a sense of grim duty, based upon fear or shame, then it's almost as if we are saying nothing else binds people to the natural environment uh, than that narrow range of emotions. But what if that's not true? What if there are stronger, more affirmative bonds, bonds of love and loyalty? What if we really are part of the natural world out of which we evolved, which mothered us into existence? In a sense, that was the beginning for me of eco-psychology, an attempt to find ecology 
within the context of human psychology and in, in turn to find human psychology within the context of ecology. When people first come to therapy, I have them fill out a questionnaire and one of the questions has to do with their relationship to the larger world. What news items seem to catch their interest, what issues in the larger world uh, get their attention, and also what their relationship is with the natural world. We have really narrowed our relating to the world, the natural world included, to dominance and control back to this bounded, masterful, self-contained individual who's supposed to control one's life and control the input. But the only way we can control so much input, I think, is to kind of shut down and narrow our focus. So we get up, we read the paper, we have our breakfast, we go to work, we come home, we watch TV, we kind of shut down. It's a very passive activity. We go to bed and we get up and do it again. A young friend was talking the other day about feeling quite depressed about the state of American culture. That people are in jobs that are not fulfilling and they're staying there because what else can they do? They're staying in relationships that aren't satisfying because what can they do? We don't know how to make them alive and, and, um, and open them to diversity, meaning diverse experience, diverse emotional diversity. We've narrowed down our, our uh, emotional experience and depression is the result. That's what depression is, a narrowing down one's experience closing down. Carl Anthony is president of Earth Island Institute and director of the Urban Habitat Program in San Francisco, California. Trained as an architect and town planner, he has developed innovative urban land use planning projects throughout the U.S. The thing about eco-psychology, which is potentially so valuable, I think, is that, uh, that it's very personal. It's oceanic, but it also comes down to touching individuals where they really hurt, where they need to be healed. And I personally see it as a way out. What the field of eco-psychology really tells us is that the healing of the planet and the healing of the self go together. There is a connection between the challenge of eco-psychology of bringing us closer to nature and the challenge of dissolving some of those sort of hard um, lines of distinction that have existed between people of different cultures. It's been my very strong feeling that the sort of enlargement of the self to include a connection to the land, to growing and the living things is a wonderful opportunity to really uh, counter some of these materialistic and consumer values that have so destroyed our culture. Because most of the development that we're doing, most of the economy that we uh, have been clinging to is actually going in the wrong direction at this point. It's producing more poverty than uh, affluence. It's concentrating wealth among and a smaller and smaller group of people has uh, created a situation in which the majority of people are addicted to things that don't provide great satisfaction. It is, in my eyes, for example, a significant um, development that so many big industrial systems in the world are breaking down. They don't work. The collapse of the so-called second world all the socialist economies, it seems to me, is already a manifestation that big systems are in big trouble. Now that is usually reported as the bad news of the day, and you can find it filling the media. How much is going wrong with every kind of big system, market systems, communications, you know, transportation, uh, financial systems, and so on and so on. But what if, from the planet's point of view, this is the good news? These are the systems that are ruining our planetary ecology. The prospect before us is to find graceful ways for those systems to break down, to get smaller, to decentralize, and to democratize, and to scale down to a livable human level. So to the extent that we can really align ourselves with a vision that's more life-giving, that's more healing, that actually helps us to produce justice and helps us to, uh, to uh, 
move away from this materialistic uh, point of view, but also helps to reduce the disparities uh, in consumption and, and income throughout the global community. If we, the more we can move in that direction, I think the more that we can see an end to this kind of pattern that at this point seems um, uh, very destructive. There's a great deal you can see around us in the world, which is clearly an attempt to make up for um, or overcome this sense of alienation from the natural world. Um, gimmicks, trinkets, games, t-shirts, even um, you know, video games and uh, uh, CD-ROMs, all of which are an attempt to present some aspect of the natural world to an urban industrial culture. Um, I, I interpret all of those as a kind of longing that needs to be satisfied, but I'm not sure that the products satisfy it. They more manifest a need than fill the need. If we looked, what we would find is that a tremendous number of us are moving through the world in a condition of profound grief for what is happening to the natural environment around us. And that's a distinctly different feeling than guilt or shame or fear. It is grief. It's grieving for things dear to us and profoundly beloved, which we are losing. What if that grief is not being given a chance to express itself? What if that's one of the things we are most deeply suffering from? We cannot, we are not free, we have not even got the language to express how deep our grief is for what we see happening and know is happening around us. What if, in fact, we know these things in ways that don't even require newspaper reports? What if we just know that the rainforests are dying, that the seas are dying? What if we just know that? What if we know that the species are dying and nobody has to tell us which species or how many or count them? We just know it's happening. 